everyone, and welcome back to the show. So today's guest is someone that I have huge respect for. Uh, he's built an incredible career, done so much stuff on on a global level. Really, is have a very, had a very impressive footprint uh, in the industry that he's in, and is also someone that I just like following on the internet. Just like a cool guy. So it's a real pleasure to have you on the show today, Chad. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So there's a ton of stuff I want to talk to you about today, about your career, about creativity, you know, you know, building a business, all of those things. But what I want to start with first is, you know, if anyone follows you on Instagram, you've got like kind of a, a quirky way that you put yourself out there. It's fun. It's interesting. I really want to know, like, what makes you tick? Man, uh, not 100% sure. Uh, I guess I got to figure that one out. Um, going with the moment, you know, as best I can. Uh, shit. That's a, that's a real hard question. Cause you know, you spend so much time doing it instead of thinking about it. You know, I'm, I'm not really a pre-planner. I'm not try not to be a creature of habit. So, uh, I guess what makes me tick is just trying to, um, enjoy every day, you know, uh, typical answer probably, uh, you know, uh, man, I feel like I try to be an introspective person, but like, that aspect of it isn't, isn't one that, uh, that I think about much, you know, I, I, I see a lot of dudes that are, um, super into the definition of themselves and I, I don't necessarily want to be that guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason that I ask is I think you're, you're a bit hard to pin down. You know, you're not like that guy. Like you're not like a really clearly like, Oh, I, I've got to read on that guy. You've got, a lot of interests, you live life to the fullest. And that's actually one of the things that I love the most about um, being one of your audience members. It's like you've got your foot on the gas at all times and you seem to really get the most out of life all the time and being in that moment. And there is always a sense that there's not quite a plan. Like, you know, it's like you're, you, you're behind the wheel, but maybe you're like behind the wheel and you're kind of like looking at the landscape and you're just kind of going. That's definitely it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess I got the... the uh, what would you say? Like the, the missing out thing, you know, like the fear of missing out a bit, you know, like I, I, I grew up in Michigan where like, you know, I didn't grow up with much, you know what I mean? My parents weren't poor, but we didn't have a lot either. And, uh, I think I always wanted to, you know, I'd see things in like Thrasher or something and I'd want to do all this stuff. And now I'm like, well, shit, I can, I can kind of do a lot of it. So I just want to go for it, but I don't want to have like a point A to point B viewpoint, you know? Mm -hmm. I want to be able to, with anything, not just traveling or whatever, but anything in life, if something seems like it would make more sense or be more interesting or inspiring, I just want to be able to have the freedom to go that way. I know a lot of people, they get set on their goal and that's that, you know, and I'm not, I don't know, maybe it's ADHD. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I, but I, I can't roll like that, you know? Well, how's that benefited your life? Like your life, your career, your relationships, how's that benefited that? being somewhat flexible in a lot of ways. Um, but also being able to, when things go wrong, let it go really fast, you know, like rather than, you know, analyzing it. Yeah, for sure. To figure out what's going on, what, why or whatever, but also not when, you know, when things fall apart to not let it totally destroy you, you know what I mean? Cause you know, there's other things there's, you know, life keeps on rolling or whatever. Yeah. So it gives you more perspective, like you're flexible, but you also have perspective that like, Hey, if something falls apart, yes, that sucks. Yes, it hurts, but you can recover because you've got like a bigger picture. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I've found most of the time when things that are terrible go down, it's just making way for something cool that's coming. You know, that it's something that maybe you wouldn't be able to have experienced because you were in the other situation. So you're like, well, you know, screw it. I'm just going to keep my eyes open and see what happens, you know? Yeah, yeah. So tell me where it hasn't worked out for you, though, that kind of being in the moment, like a little like there's no clear A to B momentum. Where hasn't it worked out for you in your life or your career or your relationships? Health. Mm. Definitely health would be like the first thing that pops into my head. Physical health, mental health or both? Um, I would say mostly physical. You know, I think like a lot of that is, you know, living in the moment means saying kind of, you know, not really worrying about the greater, um, effect of what, what happens to you. You know what I'm saying? So like, you're like, Oh, I'll do this right now. It's cool. Uh, whatever. I'll eat this thing or I'll 
I'll sit around today, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and then as time goes by, you know, time does go by pretty quick. All of a sudden you're like, holy shit, I'm fat. I'm out of breath going up the stairs, you know, like um, it affects your uh, libido even, you know, to where relationships like the, the chain of events there can get messed up, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, man, OK, so that didn't work out for me. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that part of it, I think your health really does take some planning ahead and some consideration and uh, some some sort of concern. That's probably the major thing as far as mental health goes. You know, I've, I've suffered with depression my whole life and uh, it, it comes and goes like everybody, you know what I mean? Or a lot of people. I think, you know, sometimes you can get into a hole, but I, I think like that's one positive of the kind of looking around all the time, I think kind of gets you out of that hole pretty fast. Yeah. Well, one of the things, and man, thank you for sharing that um, around everything, the, uh, the things that you struggle with. One of the things I've found like highly creative people or highly driven people tend to have real swings with like depression and anxiety. Uh, is that something that you see a lot in your industry and in the tattoo industry? I think there is. I mean, it's tough because a lot of people don't like to talk about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A lot of, I think a lot of people place this like, um, when you're talking about the things that are getting you down or, or whatever, whether it's the big picture or the little moment or whatever, there's this idea that, um, that you're being negative and nobody wants to be negative and we can't deal with negativity and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, I always saw it as a positive cause you're letting it out. You're airing it. The people around you can get to know each other more by the things that bother them so much more than the things that they like, you know what I mean? In my opinion. And I, I always think of that as a positive. So, but that being said, a lot of times, yeah, people get together in, the, in, in our, our industry or, or many probably, and, and they want to just have fun and they want to whatever. So I think, you know, some people have big issues. Some people don't. Some hide them with substance abuse. Some don't. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I think it's there. So let's talk about your career. So, you know, born and raised in Michigan. Is that right? Yeah. All right. So. Tell us a little bit about growing up, you know, your family dynamic and also getting into the early stages of your career. Okay. Well, I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, my parents were together my whole life. They didn't get divorced or anything. But my mom, my mom had a lot of health issues. She had cancer and multiple sclerosis. And my dad had PTSD from the war that he denied having, etc. So there was a lot of tension in, in my house, you know. I wouldn't say it was an abusive environment, but it was, it was a little tension the town I grew up in is a little, a little tense too, <laughs> but I think it made for interesting times. A lot of creativity got sparked from that. A lot of people were doing cool bands and stuff like that. And skateboarding was really great. You know, I, I discovered that at a young age. Um, and through skateboarding, I had met my teeth who the guy who taught me to tattoo and forgive me if sometimes I go off track, my brain's kind of yeah, dude, you're like killing starfish. It, you're dude. Great. So. <laughs> All right. So, when you first started getting into tattooing, that's like over 20 years ago. If you're not within culture, if you're not someone who's been tattooed a lot from an outsider's perspective, you might not know this, but totally different world 20 years ago, tattooing to today. So what do you think has changed from now until then that you like? Like, what are the changes that you like that have changed in that time? First thing that pops into my head is it's, a you know, as far as the changes that I like is um, the uh, it's not as it's not dangerous really anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I haven't seen or been a part of a fight in the tattoo shop in a long time, you know? And, <laughs> uh, and, and we haven't had to like physically throw anybody out in a long time or anything like that. Yeah. And, and yeah. that part's really cool, you know, like not having to have guns and shit like that, you know, like that's pretty sweet. <laughs> totally. Um, customers, clients, you know, they're a little more educated which can be a slight double-edged sword at times, but I think that clients are getting much more interesting and cool tattoos. Some are a little more, you know, willing to go with the flow than they used to be and things like that. That's, that's really nice. Um, I think diversity in tattooing is cool. It's not just white guys anymore, you know, and I think that's really nice to see that perspective and, you know, that opportunity for people. I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's probably a ton more that I can think of too, I, you know, but once again, you know, not to use the same 
terminology a lot, but a lot of it's double-edged sword stuff, you know, like like the internet, you know, on one hand, you're seeing all these great tattoos and stuff in, in real time, right? But it also like completely dilutes the whole thing and, you know, also homogenizes a lot of what you're seeing. And so that's, you know, definitely equal plus and minus, you know, there. So. Yeah. Well, in that last point, I, I, it's really interesting in relation to you because, you know, I'm going to date myself here. I'm, I'm in my late, getting into my late forties now. So when I first started getting tattooed and even then it had progressed a lot from being like kind of just more of like a real, real fringe thing. When I first started getting, getting tattooed, it was like scary and you had to like find a good, like really had to like know who to go to and take a look and you're going to get some bad tattoos and all that stuff. Now it does seem more, um, like you can go from city to city and kind of like just go to a lot of different shops and get a tattoo that would look very similar to a tattoo that you get in a different city in a different shop. And what I find really interesting is that your style is so unique. Like it's like you could look at it and be like, oh, I know who did that tattoo right off the bat. And that seems to be like, I don't know if it's rare now because like, you know, there are a lot of people you could, but yours is like really, really specific. So was that intentional for you? Is that something that just organically happened? I think there was a desire, but not a physical, um, I, I didn't physically try to make it that way. Um, mm. I think that, you know, the idea, the hope that you always have is like, Oh, I hope I can be unique. I hope I can be whatever my thing. Mm. But as I progressed through tattooing, I mean, I worked in street shops most my, my whole you know, first 15 years, 16 years of tattooing. And a lot of that was, you know, doing so many different things, which inevitably is going to influence whatever it is you're trying to do. And then compound that with my own limitations, <laughs> you know, like I only have certain amount of abilities in drawing and stuff. So they kind of come out the way they come out, you know? And, um, so there was a lot of that. I wasn't, you know, I guess when you first start out, you're, trying to emulate certain things that other people are doing because you, you know, you have your own ideas and maybe somebody else is doing that idea, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But it organically changes, you know, but I think now, um, like I say, with, with being able to see things constantly, I, th mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get it in their head that a thing is supposed to look like this. Yeah. So they try to make it look like that. Right. Do you know? And I think when I started tattooing, the idea was you wanted to give them, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up. I was getting tattooed by Civ in 98 at a convention in New Orleans, and I told him I wanted to travel and go to shops. And he said, well, what do you do that nobody in the shop is doing? And he's like, because why would we have a guest that isn't doing something different than everybody else? And I was like, oh, Okay. You got to, you know what I mean? You got to like offer something different. I didn't have the skill to intentionally do that, <laughs> but, but I think maybe subconsciously it developed that way because I kept thinking about that. Like, why would I come, why would I do anything and be the same as everybody else? Why would they come to me? And that also becomes part of economics, right? Like you're like, if I'm offering the same thing as everybody else, maybe I'm going to starve, <laughs> you know? So... <laughs> <laughs> right, man. Every part of that story was sicker than the last part of that story. Like, as you told that story, so I was getting tattooed by Sif, blah, blah. I was like, oh, this is going to be really good. <laughs> yeah. He dropped some nuggets on me, man. I, stuff I'll remember forever, you know? Yeah. Well, man, I, you know, I, I, I pity myself for not being in a position where I can get career advice from Siv. Maybe I can, man, let's go, let's talk about that move though. So like you were tattooing in Michigan for a long time before you decided to move. Is that right? Oh no, actually. Um, okay. I started tattooing in late August of 97. Mm -hmm. And then my teacher and I went to a tattoo convention in LA called ink slingers ball. That's a pretty mm -hmm. cool name, right? <laughs> and, uh, we were there and I met this dude from, from Ohio called Squirrely and me and Whoa. Squirrely got along pretty good. He was a pretty interesting, pretty wild dude, actually. Well, his name is Squirrely. I mean, he needs to be. Yeah, totally. I know he was like a president of some motorcycle club for a while. And I know that the assistant that he had with him, he made him ride in the bed of his pickup truck all the way from Youngstown, Ohio <laughs> to L.A. <laughs> 
It, it, it's totally wild. So anyway, for some reason, I thought it'd be a great idea to go work with this guy. Um, it makes perfect sense, Matt. So he, he writes me, uh, or he calls the shop end of September after we're back. And he's like, Giant, I need somebody to come and cover shifts. You need to come down here. And I'm like, uh, and I asked my teacher and he's like, yeah, you should do it. So I go down there and it's busy for the week that I'm there. Mm-hmm. And then he offers me this job and I'm like, well, it's not that busy back home. And I know if you're going to learn anything, you got to go to where you're working. So I go down there and needless to say, it just wasn't busy, blah, blah, blah. My teacher, he went traveling. Long story short, he ended up in Alabama at a real busy shop there. And they needed a guy and I needed the work. So I ended up moving there by December of that year. So I, I'd, I'd moved three times for tattooing within, you know, four months. Damn. All right. So did that kind of like get your idea about traveling for work and, and um, being able to hone your skill internationally? Was that the beginning of that or did you stay still for a long time? It may have been a spark, but it was a spark that mm-hmm. laid dormant for a long time. I stayed in okay. Alabama from Christmas Eve of 97 until Easter-ish of 2001. So I was mm-hmm. there um, working at this busy street shop. It was insane, you know, really, really crazy. Uh, probably stuff I wouldn't want to talk about publicly, um, <laughs> you know. But um, I learned a lot there. I learned how to tattoo. I learned how to talk to people and deal with people and, and do things fast and, you know, whatever else. And um, I ended up um, my then wife, my daughter's mother, and I got a divorce and things got weird at the shop and I left and uh, then I moved up to Ohio and that's when everything really started taking off, you know, ended up in Cleveland, totally on a whim. My, my brother, Pat was a BMXer and he, he kind of lived near Chenga world skate park up there. And uh, I just kind of went to go see him cause I was pretty bummed, man. My whole life fell apart. You know what I mean? And he had just met Greg Christian like three days before that somewhere and just my brother pat's got a lot of balls so he calls and he's like hey can my brother come and work at you guys tattoo shop you know (laughs) and somehow greg was going out of town for a convention and they needed somebody to cover so i covered and then it all worked out and and then working with greg and and the other guys at the shop man it, it was like oh this is a possibility to do more go places and you know, because the guy in Alabama, I owe him a lot, but he really, his his motivation was to keep you there, to keep you making money for him, you know? Mm-hmm. And and that's okay. I understand that, I guess. But in Cleveland, it was more of a bigger thing, you know? They, they wanted you to do more, you know, to be who you were, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it, it, it was like, okay, this is it, you know? It, uh, there's a lot more to it. I don't know how much you want to hear. But. Well, you know, I... I want to hit a point that I think is like, cause it, it shows up in tattoo culture a lot, I think. And it shows up in, in all sorts of businesses. And there's kind of like a, from a business owner perspective, you could either view cultivating talent as a goal of like, I want to build really, really good talent, but I want them to stay in shop. Like they have to stay here. And that, cause that's one way of looking at it. Or you can be like, I'm going to cultivate really incredible talent. And it's kind of like the biggest compliment in the world if they end up going over to somewhere else and like doing well somewhere else, because they, I taught them so well that they can go and make that leap. And maybe they outgrew the nest and maybe they're, maybe they're ready for the next thing. And it doesn't have to be either or, but one of the things that I think about when building a business is like the anxiety of trying to build super good talent, but trying to keep them like, well, no, I just want them for myself because you know, if you want to invest in someone and have them really like evolve and grow, why wouldn't you want the best possible scenario for them? So there is a little bit of like real dedication to the craft of developing people. And then also a bit of selflessness of being like, not only am I going to help you grow, but also I'm going to help you grow on your way out of here into your next great thing, because I want you to be successful yourself. So I see that in the tattooing world. I, I hear that a lot from people. It's like, ah, oh, you know, I owe this guy a lot, but like, you know, we kind of, we don't have such a great relationship because I left. Tell me about that, man. Tell me about that side of it. It's a pretty crazy thing. And it's so different for everybody, you know, based on their own I mean, I feel like back all the way to the way their parents were to them when they were a child, you know, 
for example, my, the guy who taught me to tattoo, I've known him since I was six years old. Um, he was like a punk rocker, you know, he saw minor threat. He was a skateboard guy, uh, taught me a bit about that. Um, he was the first person I called when my mom died. You know what I mean? He, he talked to me about some really lofty concepts of heaven and hell and (laughs) death and dying. And at 15, it really like gave me a lot of perspective, you know? And so I always wanted to be a tattooer ever since I saw him tattooing in this old and also this old Thrasher magazine that had a tattoo special. It, it just was like, this is what I want to do. But I never wanted to tell him that because I had too much respect for him. I, I, I couldn't just be like, hey, I want to do what you do. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, this guy's done so much here. And who am I to say that? Right. But eventually he, you know, the conversation came up. I started tattooing. But then I always felt like, okay, what, not by any, he didn't put this pressure on me, but I always felt like I needed to make him proud. Even when we had a falling out, I felt like I needed to do and push myself, my career, my tattooing, whatever, to the farthest limits in hopes that he would be proud of me in some way, which is weird because I've never really given much of a shit about what anybody's thought, you know, but, but I respect the bigger picture of this thing. It's, you know, he gave, he gave me this gift, even though he didn't know he was necessarily giving it to me. And I didn't want to just, you know, not care about that or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So through that and whatever warped sense of perspective that I had on it, I've thought to myself the same thing. Now I'm in a position, uh, having the shop where I have employees and we had an apprentice and all this kind of stuff. And it's similar to what you're saying there. Like th- there is like a, a kind of a, both of those things combined though, you know, you're like, okay, I want to give these people as much as I can. And hopefully their path takes them wherever they want to go to, to push themselves to whatever level they want to push themselves to, whether that's staying with me or leaving, it's okay. Obviously I would love it if they stayed with me because they've turned into some of my best friends and, and whatever. And, but at the same time, yes, them moving on and, and really becoming something would be, you know, more than what any of us could imagine even would be, would be really cool. I mean, they're all, I don't mean to say that they're not something, you know what I mean? Cause they're all amazing. It's kind of, you know, it's a, it is weird like that. You know, you, you, uh, you want both, you know? Um, I hope I answered that question well. <laughs> You hit it. And it, cause it's a tough question. Like, you know, when you invest in people, like I, I think a lot in, in my industry, um, cause what I do is so specific and what I've developed for the company is like, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's like super unique, but I have a very specific style of how I do things. And that's why I've been able to build up the company. So when I teach people things, I'm always a little like, you know, this is this thing I came up with at the same time. Like I care about people and I, I want them to do a good job and I want them to feel empowered and I don't want anyone to leave, but you know what, if someone left and it was cause they had kind of outgrown the nest and they were ready for the next thing, like, man, that's a huge success. And I'd be sad about it. And I might be a little nervous that they might become my competition, but at the same time, you got to respect that you did a good job helping someone evolve and change and grow and that they have the guts to go on to the next thing. And I think that's cool. Well, well, I, I agree with you totally. I, I think, I think the thing is, is like, I try and give the people that are at my shop, okay, everything that I have in whatever way that is, whether it's, you know, artistic, um, life advice, the way to deal with people, anything, just, you know, little things, you know, the little tiny things in, in life that are the chain of events to other whatever. And yeah, I do want them to stick around as long as they can. I do want them to do that. But if they do move forward, that's great. I, it's not the end of what I'm learning and growing to be as myself either. So I don't, I don't have that kind of, oh shit, they're leaving with what I've given them and whatever might happen. It's like, well, that's cool, but I'm still evolving too, right? I'm still going to come up with new ideas. I'm still going to come up with new things. And as much as I don't want anybody to leave when they leave, it's even a bigger kick in your butt to go, well, okay, I have to come up with more stuff. I can't just be me and that's it. Like, you, you know, you don't want to just be, you don't want to write your book and just be the book. Cause you just go on a shelf and nobody reads you anymore. You know what I'm saying? 
So you, you have to like, you have to keep writing. You have to keep doing and being and whatever, you know, or if you're gonna end your book, you got to recognize that you retired. Yeah. 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 Man. I love that. That was super powerful. Um, all right, let's talk about the shop. And because I got all sorts of questions about this. Uh, what's the significance of the name Adventure Tattoo? Oh, man. Well, so this guy, Bill Baker in uh, Toronto, he's a tattooer from, from Canada. Amazing guy. Done, he's done so much shit. Um, he was telling me years and years ago about a shop in Toronto called Adventure Tattoo. And I was like, I'm stealing that if I ever open a tattoo <laughs> shop because that's the coolest name ever. And I was like, here I am flying all over the world, trying to do shit, trying to have an adventure in my life, you know? And I was like, that makes sense, right? Like, I was like, I can't think of anything that, that makes more sense than that. So, you know, and I got to steal it from a story from a friend of mine. (laughs) So I thought that was pretty bitching, you know? (laughs) I love it, man. So Tell me about how travel plays into into your profession and like in your professional experience, because I know travel has been a huge part of your life in general and that you're often working as you're as you're uh, traveling. So tell us about that. OK, my mom, she always wanted to do stuff. She, she always would date. You know, I, I want to go here. I wish I could go there. She just died. She never went anywhere and she died. And I remember like thinking, well, if I ever have the opportunity to go do stuff, I'm doing it because I'm not dying, not having done the crap that I want to do. That that's just kind of sucks, right? So as soon as I started tattooing and as soon as all that, and I saw that there was this opportunity to go to other you know, countries for conventions and things like that, that was, that was why I left Ohio because I got a job offer at a shop that was consistently doing conventions in Europe. And I was like, well, I got to go there. So I did that, started meeting people, started making friends in other countries, getting invited to go work there. And I was like, this is just so cool because you're not just in the same place all the time, getting the same inspiration. You're, you're getting all these perspectives. You're, you're uh, seeing all this different crap that you're, you would never see in real life, you know, and all these different images and, and whatever. And it, uh, it was just a no brainer, man. I, you know, you had to, I I just loved it and I had to keep going with it. And I also, there was probably that little bit of like, well, you know, thinking about mom dying, how quick life goes, blah, 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 Mm. wanting to rack up a bunch of experiences. You know what I mean? And like, at some point you just feel like it's normal. You know, there was periods where I didn't live anywhere and I was just living out of a suitcase and tattooing here and there. And And I needed to do the work part because I had to pay child support and I had to keep going and have money to fly back to see my kid. And, you know, like economics played a huge role in the constant traveling and the constant working, you know. But whenever I could make time and had enough money to do something in in the middle, I would try and carve out a week or two weeks to go and just soak stuff up, you know. Yeah. Um, So I know you've had a ton of great experiences traveling, probably some challenging experiences happening. But what if you were to think about it, is there any that stands out as being really like life changing? Like any of these travel um, where you were like working somewhere in a different country with a different group of people that actually changed you? It's a, it's a little hard to put into words or, or explain completely. But like the early days of visiting Europe, and tattooing with friends there and just seeing how differently they interacted with their clients and um, kind of structured their day, um, the things that they put importance on versus not, you know, things that weren't important and stuff like that really affected my perspective, you know. Um, A lot of the desires of not wanting to be the typical American tourist guy or whatever, you know, like kind of understanding what what it was that was ugly about that and trying to to be different than that really like gets into who you are as a person and, and, and just things like, you know, going to countries where things aren't quite as organized as here. And realizing that a lot of this organization is actually like kind of detrimental and, and somewhat worthless and, mm-hmm. and going, okay, fuck it. You know, like 
you know, oh, there's a solid yellow line there. Why am I sitting here in my car when I could just go around it and move on with my day just because there's somebody painted a yellow line there? Now that's literally and metaphorically, right? Yeah. Like that yellow line doesn't mean anything because I can still cross it, you know? And I went, whoa, you know? All those songs I listened to as a kid, like My Rules or whatever, that's real, dude, in a real practical adult way, you know? So that shit really was like, you know, there, there it is. Not to mention things like going to India or, or Africa or something and getting a whole different perspective on life and death and, you know, what that means and, and time, you know, ep- economics, big time in economics, man. You know, it's like when you have this limited world around you, you have like a totally different idea of what it means to what you do with your money that you make even, you know? And it's like when, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but when I see all these really poor people in the world and people that are suffering and I'm like, I have a different kind of means than they have, I should use it. You know, like I, whether it is to help people or even just to do things for myself, like to like, you, you see people that are doing well, but they're like hoarding everything and they're just, you know, living in an austere way, but they have this big bank account or whatever. Isn't that like a bigger f- fuck you to poor people than actually spending it? You know what I mean? Cause there's so many people that can't even eat and, and it's like, well you have, so at least do it. It's like, it's like the people that die, you owe it to them to live. Right. So, I mean, you know, it's just things like that. Just lots of little yeah. weird things. Super cool. Like, but what I'm interested in is all of those lessons, how have they impacted the way that you run a shop and the way that you're a boss and the way you do a business? So how did those things play into adventure tattoo, especially that idea? Like, okay, my rules, right? There's that yellow line. Well, it's, I mean, realistically, it's just a line on a, on a road. What does that actually mean? Okay but you actually also run a business where people have certain expectations and like there's health codes and all that kind of stuff. So how does that impact how how you run a shop? (laughs) Funnily enough, I'm like, Oh, uh, my rules, uh, no rules, blah, blah, blah. But I also have a bunch of rules in my shop. (laughs) 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 So if anything, you know, understanding which, which rules in life are kind of like wastes and, um, security things that people create so they feel like they're more safe or, or in, not in like a, a real way but more in a like no no change will happen kind of way you know as far as my employees go I, I think it encourage I encourage them to do what they want how they want but I also try and guide that a little bit when I see there are things that could be better for them or better for the big picture I'm not so strict. My guys, they, they need to go somewhere they can go. You know what I mean? It's a weird one to like want them to be free. Right. But also to acknowledge that the bills got to get paid. You know what I mean? So one Mm -hmm. way I've done that is even though I've just recently taken on a a bigger uh, space and, and a little more rent, I always thought it was very important that I'd be able to cover all the bills alone. Mm -hmm. So if everybody left, Cool. You know, I want the people that work for me to be there because I want them to be there, not because I need them to be there. And -hmm. I think that's a huge, you know, obstacle in most businesses that you build yourself to where you need the people to be there. And therefore, then you compromise things that you probably shouldn't compromise or don't want to compromise or tears apart your vision. Mm -hmm. The trickle down effect of that is is crazy, right? So that's always been a big thing. I I don't want the pressure of having to have anything happen. So it's just things that I want to have happen, but I try to um, consult also with the people that work for me as to what they want to have happen. So that way I know how to build the experience there to benefit them the most that I can. Yeah. I hope that was a good answer. That was perfect, man. Because it leads me to my next question. This again, problem in all, in all businesses I think it plays in pretty heavily into um, the tat- tattooing industry, especially as a shop owner. How do you manage that line between boss and friend? I keep it, I, I manage the line between boss and friend by just keeping it as honest as I possibly can. I'll fire my friend in a minute if they need to be fired. 
I, I won't, you know, I, I may, I may take some time debating on what that means, you know, if I have to, but I'm not going to not do what's best for the bigger picture because someone is my friend. And if they're really my friend, they'll be able to talk to me about it and we'll be able to work it out and come to some sort of understanding and it'll be okay. Mm. And if they're not my friend, then we won't. And therefore you have one less thing that you have to worry about. You know what I mean? It, it's sad to lose a friend, but if, if the circumstances prove that they're not an actual friend, then, then who cares? You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Uh, owning a business, man, it's, uh, it's tough, especially businesses where you employ people that you genuinely like and become friends. But, uh, uh what you just said is, uh, it adds, it, it simplifies life when, when relationships change because you had to make a decision. And, um, if, if people are still with you afterwards, it's like, yeah, that's one hell of a friend. Good. Tried and true. If they're not, then it simplifies life. It, it gives you clearer vision. Uh, absolutely. I, I think it's just important to, to kind of have a base idea of your goal in your business and in your, you know, whatever your life surrounding that is, let that be organic and change, but know that you have to have some sort of a line in the sand where if it crosses that too much, then it's just got to be done, you know? Yeah. And yeah. once you have that, but you also let them know that, you know what I mean? I, I tried with all my guys to clearly define the things that I'm okay with and not okay with, or rather the things that I'm absolutely not okay with and everything else kind of goes, you know what I mean? We'll deal with it in the moment, but as long as you have that boundary and you're honest and open about it and straightforward about it in the beginning, then there's no question. I think a lot of that ambiguity and that like vagueness is, is a thing that really sets you up for a lot of headaches, failures and, and whatnot later on, you know, but a lot of people are afraid of that, man. Nobody likes confrontation anymore, but I think confrontation in a lot of people's minds has too strict of a, of a definition, you know, like I think you, you have to have, I think friendship in order to have a real friendship, you have to be okay with confrontation with each other. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, 100%. Um, all right. So let's talk about the customer though, because this is where it gets interesting. Uh, why don't you break down the saying for me, the customer is your enemy. Okay. I actually want to refine that a little bit. I, okay. I realized that the, the, the saying customer is your enemy comes off wrong. And a lot of people <laughs> seem to tend to turn off their brain at like a phrasing and they, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I was thinking this morning in the shower, I was like, maybe it's more that the customer is their own enemy. Mm, okay. I like this. Tell me more. Yeah. Because I mean, okay. In the context of tattooing, more so in a street shop than in a custom environment. Okay. Um, the customer comes in. Some people know what they want and they're reasonable and they're open. They understand the procedure, blah, blah, blah. And that's cool. A lot of people come in though. They want something that's a bit unrealistic at a size. that's unrealistic and a placement that's not going to look good. They come in on FaceTime on their phone. They have their best friend talking for them. They come in with a bag of smelly food <laughs> you know, they, whatever it is, they try and vape in your shop. They want to argue with you on a price. They don't want to sit well. They're their own worst enemy because mm -hmm. all of those things they're doing are affecting the quality of what they're getting. Now we can break that down into any kind of business. They're, they're going to come at you. People are going to come at you with these expectations or ideas or, or hard-headedness, uh, you, you always, for some reason, people right now think it's great to be a control freak. I'm a control freak. Like, that's a positive trait. It's like, well, that, but it's just not, you know? Like, we're, we're a lot of businesses that have anything to do with creativity or, or production or whatever, it has to be a collaborative effort. So nobody can be a total control freak. So, therefore, when you're trying to deal with that in a way that's beneficial for your client because it's not that it's I'm seeing them as an quote unquote enemy as to them doing what I want them to do. It's that they're getting in the way of me being able to do what is best for them, what they're coming to me for. But mm. sometimes there's a better version and sometimes you do have to just go, okay, this person, they're never going to be happy with anything other than this. So, okay, whatever they're still their own enemy in that way though, you know, because they're walking out with something that could be so much better. 
And yeah. so, uh, you know, that's, that's the concept is how do you work with that? How do you figure out how to, um, m- m- give them an experience that makes them happy in every possible way? Yeah. I was just, just telling a story to my girlfriend yesterday about, uh, one of my best friends is a guy named Scott Veldone, uh, at Eternal Image Tattoo in Calgary. And I was telling a story of all the tattoos he's talked me out of getting are, are a lot more than the tattoos he's actually put on my body. And the tattoos he's put on me have always been like true blue, super awesome. Like they're, they're great. And very often I'll be like, Oh, I want this or that. And he'll be like, really cool about it. He's never dismissive, but like, Hey man, you just got to trust me here. And when he says that, I know I'm edging towards one of those disastrous like decisions that that I want to make. Um, and it's, it's cool because he's also like, we have such a long relationship that obviously I just inherently trust him. So there's a a little bit of, I think of like clients being their own, own worst enemies. And I think a lot of industries can be like, relate to that. I know I can relate to that. And also it's about how you phrase it. Like, how do you talk to people about that, about those like disastrous decisions? You know, like how do you have those, those conversations with them? I, I think it's really important to, it's hard with masks. It used to be, make sure you're smiling. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so, <laughs> now you got to show it with your eyes, you know, so you're like yeah. over accentuating, accentuating <laughs> a squint or something. But um, I think I think smiling, being engaging, paying attention to them, showing uh, empathetic tone in your voice. Confidence is, is everything Con- like being like, well, how about this? That doesn't work. You know, when you're like, hey, this thing or or whatever confidence is so much because most people want a leader okay whether it's a a group of two or a group of 200 they're they're looking for a person often that can show them the way some are looking in a longing way some are looking in a uh, skeptical manner so you have to show that confidence but not arrogance and not you know I think they can see right through it if you're just trying to do it for you but when you're doing it for them a lot of people will see it that way and a lot of it's, you know, having a good vocabulary and, and a, oh, a, you know, a good way of putting the words together to let them know that, hey, I'm, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for you. I'm trying to get you the best thing I can do. And yeah. it's OK if, if you don't want that. But just know that I'm offering it to you. All right. So three final questions before for you as we're wrapping up here. So the first is a tough one. And it's a two part question. So I want you to think of you as a person, you as a, and you as a professional, you as a tattooer or a shop owner, and you can go in any of those directions. What's misunderstood about you? I think the list of things that I perhaps misunderstand about myself may be too deep to get into <laughs> and too long <laughs> of a conversation. Um, but I think it's good fuel for the way forward uh, in my own life. Uh, as far as what other people misunderstand depending on the the situation some of it is uh you know when I was traveling a lot that there was this obsession to travel do you need to travel do you I didn't need to do shit you know what I mean I think I I needed to travel at the time because I didn't have enough clientele in one spot to sustain the living I needed to make to pay my child support and the other bills I had in my life so I kept going all over because that's what helped me when I found a place I wanted to settle down, I settled down. I had no, you know, compulsion or, or addiction to any of that kind of thing. So I think that was a misunderstood. Uh, um, yeah. So, somehow being misunderstood. Um, okay. and then also now I think there is also in the shop environment, I think from people that visit and, and maybe sometimes some of the people that work for me, some of the rules, quote unquote, that I have in the shop, I think are thought of as just things that bother me so much. And yes, some of them are things that bother me, but I also have a lot of these little things in the shop that I think make the day to day life kind of work better for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Some of the distractions, some of the other things that I'm like, no, nah, we don't do that here. Whereas some people can condition themselves to not be they don't think they're bothered by it, but it's still interference, you know? So I think there is that misconception. Part two, the same question. What is perfectly understood about you? 
what's something that's out there about you either as a person or a professional in any way or as a boss that you think is like, yep, that's understood about me accurately? Whew. <laughs> that's tough because that that question I think can me answering it could be borderline just my ego. I'm not really sure. Um, I I would think that from what I hear, because I don't know what everybody thinks really, right? A lot of people say I'm nice. I think I'm pretty nice. <laughs> You're very nice. You're very nice. I think that's a thing. I I think. I hope. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good answer. All right. So second question. Pandemic ends. Everything's wrapped up. Everything's done. And I know this answer could change an hour from now or tomorrow or a week from now. So you're not, no one's holding this to you. But pandemic's over. Top three places that you want to visit. Mm. Man, top three places. Well, I'll tell you this. Very selfishly, I want to go sit on a beach so bad, dude. I want to I want to soak up some rays. I want to get fucking bronzed. I want to <laughs> swim in the ocean. You know what I'm saying? That's like number one. So I, I, I don't know. A beach that's chill, no music, <laughs> not a lot of people. I don't really care where that is, dude. Anywhere where it's blue and nice. I miss a lot of my friends a lot. So second place, that's tough because I got homies all over the place. You know what I mean? But I mean, I really miss my buddy Jimmy in Taiwan a lot. And I, I, I would really love to go visit him and and uh, and then other other places after that. But Taiwan would probably be my first place or, or London or England rather to go see my buddy Sam. And that's hard, man. That's a real hard one, you know. Those are three good answers, man. And then aside from all that, I miss India. You know, I'm, I really miss India. I, I, uh, I love the, the energy of India, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. I also have a really close friend there that I miss a lot. And that'd be awesome, man. But it's so hard to narrow it down to three, dude. Like, but, but I can say this. Number one, I need a beach in my life, bro. <laughs> That's a great answer. All right. Last question, man, as we're wrapping up, anything you want to leave our audience with about tattoo culture, about you, about being a boss, building a business, about anything? Um, I think the main thing is in your life, whether it's business or just your personal life or whatever, it's a good thing to be generous. It's a good thing to be self-sacrificing. It's a good thing to care about other people and want what's best for them. But you also still have to think about yourself too, because if you're not taken care of, you're not going to be able to take care of anyone else. So I think just really being honest with yourself and everyone around you is really important. I think that um, not getting too caught up in petty things that you want or need for yourself, you know, but also acknowledging the things that maybe the world might think is petty, but they're important to you. Just being real, man. Just trying to be as honest and real as you can in every aspect of your life is good. Whether it's relationships, business, friendships, whatever, you know, being a oh, parent, yeah. all of it, you know, everyone has their own life that they're living. And um, you got to remember that. Dude, well, thank you so much for being on the show. This was an uh, incredible conversation. I knew it was going to be awesome. The things we didn't get into, and I want to thank you uh, so much for that totally sick adventure tattoo shirt uh warzone ripoff is uh, always uh, appreciated super super cool we didn't talk about punk we didn't talk about hardcore but this has been an awesome conversation so uh all the best to you man and i know uh, i will see you i'll probably see you sometime this year or next year it's gonna happen for sure and thank you for the test press that was the missing oh. link that was, that was it and uh i was blown away by that thank you very much all right everyone we will see you in the outro and spencer Drop the beat.